like to welcome you all to another edition of Meet Your Merrimack Candidates, where um, every few days we've been interviewing one of the candidates for either town council or the Merrimack School Board. And today I'm very happy to be joined by Tom Koenig, who is currently a member of the town council and, all, and is also going to be running for one of the three open seats uh, on April 10th. Tom, thank you very much for joining me. Appreciate thank it very you. much. I very much appreciate being here. Well, those of you that haven't seen some of our previous episodes, I'm going to give you a little background. Is uh, What we're trying to do here is get to know the individual, the person. We're, we won't be talking politics at all. We won't be talking budget. We won't be talking uh, political philosophy. We'll be getting to know Tom Koenig, the person. Uh -oh. uh, <laughs> and there'll be, I'm sure there'll be many other shows that we'll be talking about the issues. But uh, again, that isn't what we'll be doing today. And Tom, I'd like to start right off by asking uh, where you grew up. I was uh, born and raised in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Dave. And uh, grew up there, left there when I was 18. So I, I spent all of my development years, if you will, down in the, down in the deep south. Yeah, very much so. Absolutely. And uh, did you have any brothers or sisters growing up there? I am a member of a Catholic family. I've got uh, three brothers, two brothers, and uh, five sisters. So oh, there's wow. eight of us. So there's quite a few of you. in the family, yeah, which is interesting because my mom was uh, one of two and my dad was one of two. Uh, so I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what you did. Uh, see, Louisiana, that's real interesting to me because that's, <laughs> that's something I've heard of. And, you, you know, you kind of, the outside world has their own take on it. But, again, you, you've lived there. And what did you do growing up as a teenager out in Louisiana? How did you spend your summers? Well, we spent a fair amount of time. Um, we did a lot of fishing and hunting. Uh, mostly fishing when I was growing up, when I was in my high school years, if you will. I had a good friend who owned a boat, and we'd go out, we'd drive about an hour from Baton Rouge out into the swamps, the Chafalaya Basin. And um, we'd do a lot of fly fishing off a bateau or a, a flat bottom boat. Now, is this like 16, 17 years yeah, old? Yeah, well, or? more like to, to probably 12 to 15. Oh, or so, okay. You know, was, yeah. In between that and Boy Scouts, we, we spent a lot of time out camping and, and uh, things of that nature. but. We would do a lot of fishing out in the swamps. and So basically summer was about fishing out there. To a large degree it was, yes, yeah. absolutely. That, I mean, and the standard things. You know, we'd, we'd uh, play ball with the kids in the neighborhood and stuff like that on on an empty lot down the way or something and yeah, things of that nature. Now, out in Louisiana, what were the sports teams out there? Well, we were very strong LSU Tiger fans um, okay. because my dad worked at LSU. It was only about two miles from my house in Baton Rouge, and so we were always... Uh, Tiger fans growing up, but now, the so New Orleans uh, Saints were down in New yeah, Orleans, obviously. Yeah, them. Now, were you, uh, how old were you when Pete Marowitz was? It Was he before your oh, time? He was, our, he was our big fan. No, yeah, he was, he, yeah was definitely, Pistol uh, Pete. Was growing up with Pistol Pete there, they named the stadium after him. He was, nobody could get enough of him back then. Yeah. Um, definitely. Yeah, he, he was my, uh, the Celtics were big here, but I remember when I was a kid, Pistol Pete was the guy. I mean, he was doing all the tricks and everything else. Oh, he was, yeah, he was amazing. He yeah. really was. And, uh, well, I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about what values uh, your parents instilled on you growing up that has made you the man you are today. Well, the, I mean, we came from a large family. It was a, we, I went to Catholic school up through, uh, through high school. Yeah, and um, we were definitely were, you know, the the South is is more of a Bible Belt, if you will. Louisiana is not so much a part of that, uh, and a lot of that tends to be more Baptist and things. So the right. Catholics are a little bit different, but there's a a strong level of Catholicism down in Southern Louisiana. Oh, is there really? See, I wouldn't have thought that because, like, again, up here is I mean, you go to school and. 90% of the kids are going to CCD with you later because they're Catholic, but <laughs> down the south, I always thought it was kind of the other way, or even Louisiana, I kind of figured, but that's not necessarily the case. Not necessarily, at least not where I came from. And, and uh, So my dad um, was a professor at LSU. Mm -hmm. Mom stayed home and took care of all eight of us. And uh, I, I guess from, from values and whatnot, just the, the standard responsibility and um, integrity and things of that nature that you grow up with, um, knowing that you have to be responsible for your actions, what you do. Yeah. Um, you certainly have to be honest and open and, and acting in integrity at all times. So um, yeah. that's that's a lot of what I got from my folks. 
And again, it wasn't anything they were banging on the kitchen table. It was just the way you were brought. In other words, you, you knew what was expected. Well, you did know that if you didn't do well in school that you were in trouble. Uh, I mean, uh, just anecdotally, when I uh, was taking French class and, and thought I might be getting a C in the class, uh, or even failing, my, uh, my sister, older sister decided to tell Dad at the dinner table that <laughs> Tom wasn't doing so well. And uh, I spent the next 45 minutes being grilled by my father as to why I wasn't Oh. Attending to my responsibilities of studying and things like that. And oh, wow. So that was my last year of French. Yeah. Uh, and I did squeak a C out of it. So. Oh. <laughs> well, that's a great segue into the next question, which really is, is what kind of student you were in high school? And I was not going to college yet, but high school, what kind of student you were? And where and what your favorite uh, subjects were growing up? Well, I, uh, so, I, so let me do that backwards. I excelled in science and math, and that's, that's why I ultimately went into engineering. Uh, but math was from about sixth grade on when I had a very, very good teacher uh, was one of my favorite classes. And, yeah. and I, I, you know, sought out math classes at all opportunities until I was halfway through college. But um, I was a reasonably good student. Um, my brother was valedictorian when he went through high school. Oh, really? My other brother was solidatorian. And I went to the same high school, and so a lot of the teachers there were thinking, oh, great, we've got a good one. Yeah. And I was bound determined to... To, uh, <laughs> to turn that around on them. Yeah. So I, I probably cut up a lot more than my brothers did, but I still made A's and B's. You know, yeah. I did well, but I'd sit in the back of the class with the cut-ups and, and uh, right. try to prove the teachers wrong, I guess. Right, so it's, in other words... It's that one was of those independent things. Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah, oh, absolutely. Um, and as far as high school goes, when you weren't studying, uh, were there any activities you were involved in, sports, band, anything like that? I, no, I didn't uh, get involved too much in that. I was in the choir, and uh, I got into uh, singing has been one of my things, and I still sing uh, with the family and with St. John Newman Church uh, nice. in the choir there. Oh, really? But coming up, I got into some of the, uh, the elite groups, if you will, and we had one group we called Excalibur uh, that was 14 of us, and we'd go around singing different places and dressed up in our tuxedo shirts and ties. And oh, really? Oh, really? Yeah. We uh, competed in the state uh, music uh, competition and came away with an A-plus rating uh, oh, wow. as a group, and, and I was in the choir as well. And, and so that was my big thing in high school, was being part of that music group and the music organizations. Now, were you involved in theater at all, too? Or? I, you know, I would have loved to have been in theater, but didn't have the time to do that. My sister got involved with theater and enjoyed the heck out of it. And yeah. I was around it a little bit, and, and uh, but never really got any of the big parts or anything like that. And uh, as far as uh, your singing in the choir, did you ever get involved in any type of bands or any of that afterwards, or was it all mainly no, involved in the choir? No, I can't play a, an instrument to save my life right. other than my voice. And uh, <laughs> I like to sing, enjoy singing, um, and I sing for myself. I don't <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I don't sing for anybody else. Yeah. If they like it, great. If they don't, well, that's too bad. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. But. Uh, if you could pick uh, either one memory or set of memories, what would you say was your fondest memory of growing up in Louisiana? Um, well, that's kind of an. Uh, there was so many different things yeah. that we did. I mean, being able to go out on the swamps and and uh, and fish, and we did some duck hunting and did some squirrel hunting and things like that. Walking around through the woods with the cypress trees and. Spanish moss hanging down and, and water around and trying to find some dry land to be on and stuff. Yeah. Uh, those were some uh, just amazing opportunities for us to get out and do that. Piloting boats around when I was 12 and 14. Yeah, and that part seems so neat. Um, there was some really neat stuff. Watching alligators swimming across the water and then knowing that we were swimming in that water not very long ago. Oh, uh, and now, did you live in a rural part of Louisiana? Uh, well, we were in Baton Rouge. Okay. But, but Baton Rouge, it's not like New England. It's not you know, city to city to city. Right. Up in the, you know, there were a lot of corn f or cane fields, sugar cane fields around. Um, yeah. And we drove about an hour or so to get out into the swamp area where we were going. A friend of mine had, had a boat that he would dock at a, an old Cajun's house. And yeah. we'd get on that and drive for another half an hour, 45 minutes out into the Pats Bay and, and just uh, get away from everything. I mean, you're totally isolated out there. And that's where we heard Neil Armstrong land on the moon. Oh really? You were like out there. I was out there camping on a boat, listening on a radio. And oh stuff wow! Like that, so, wow, that's great. Now, do you ever go out there? Have you been out there in the past fishing uh, in the same areas? I have been back a, a little bit. My brother, who's still down in Baton Rouge, has done a lot of uh, canoeing and kayaking, and uh, 
I've been able to go down and, s and get out there a little bit, but I haven't done much fishing since then. Uh, Most of my fishing was in Louisiana. I've uh, uh, done a little fishing when I was out in Arizona, but, uh, but yeah. I really haven't gotten back into it since. Uh, uh, that was so cool. That must have been so cool, 12, 14, 15. Like you say, you're out in your own world. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it was awesome. <laughs> it really was. Uh, so you go to high school, you graduate, and um, you mentioned a little about your, uh, your affection for math and your uh, aptitude for it. From there, where did you decide to uh, go on to college? And at that point, did you know you wanted to be an electrical engineer, or did you not quite figure out what you wanted to do with your math skills? I, that's what I was planning to do. I yeah. took some of those JETS programs, the Junior Electronic Testing Series, or whatever it was, Junior yeah. Engineering Testing Series, and uh, in high school, and then the guidance counselors were working with me. And I, yeah. I had gotten it down to mechanical engineering or electrical engineering based on the aptitudes and all that kind of stuff. Right. And my dad said to me that you had to be an extremely good at mechanical engineering because of the competition and all that kind of stuff. And so I said, fine, electrical sounds good to me. And there was never any question that you were going to college. I mean, the upbringing your Actually, father Actually, there was. Really? There was. Um, I, I because I was so contrarian and, and whatnot, so right. I, I actually approached my mom and said, you know, I might not want to go to college. Maybe I'll just go to uh, tech school and become an electrician. And, and she actually said, okay. I saw her swallow pretty hard, but she said, okay, you can do that. You know, and after about another six months or a year of my junior year of high school went by, I finally decided, no, that's not really where I want to be. You know. Well, I have to say, you definitely were a smart guy even then because you were smart enough to know to go to your mother and tell her that <laughs> and, not, and <laughs> yeah. not your father. Because based yeah, on what you said earlier, that might not have gone as smoothly. That would not have gone as smoothly, no. <laughs> but, uh, then I had to convince her later that I really did want to go to college. Yeah. But, uh, uh, what college did you end up to? I went out to Tucson, Arizona to go oh, to the really? University of Arizona. And that's where my dad went to school. Yeah. And I had some family there. And the reason that I chose that, well, one of the reasons I chose that was somewhere along about that time the military was advertising, the Army was, that we'll give you a chance to fall flat on your face. And as a, a high school student looking at that and taking that challenge, I said, you know what? If I stay around the house, I'm going to depend upon my parents. And if I go out somewhere completely, you know, on my own, right. my life will fall on my face. So let me pick Tucson, which in, in that my mind was an, uh, a compromise because I had relatives there yeah. who told me I couldn't stay with them. I mean, they loved me dearly, but I was right. not their child and they weren't responsible for me. But they were there to, to kind of be my backup support. Right, you weren't totally and alone. I had some cousins out there and stuff like that. So I, I had some backup. And, uh, now, how was, what was your father's take? Was he pressuring you, for lack of a better word, for, to go to LSU, the school he was at? or No, he was tickled that I was going to go to Tucson his because that was mater. his alma mater. Oh. And uh, I had brothers that were going to LSU already, and it looked like anybody else in the family would go there. And, and the issue there was that it was, it's fairly inexpensive if you're an in-state student to go to LSU. It's like $100 a semester or something like that. Yeah. Um, so there's no cost factor there, and so because he was raising eight kids and whatnot, there was no cost benefit to helping me go to school. And so uh, while I went out to Arizona, I took a couple of classes and uh, had a job and worked and got my residency in Arizona so that I could cut about $5,000 a semester off the cost. Oh, okay. And, so um, did you do that before you actually ever attended class, or were you yeah, doing I went, it simultaneously? I actually went one year to LSU, and then I transferred out to Tucson. Oh, okay. Took one or two courses while I was working so that I could stay attached to the college, but was working at a sporting goods store and yeah. um, got my residency. And, and you had to, if you took too many classes, then they, they got the idea that you were getting residency to lower the tuition cost. Right. And that wasn't good. So I could take one or two courses, but that was about it. So then I, I did that, and then I started going to school full time again once I could start to afford that. Yeah. Uh, got into the co-op program, got into you know, a lot of different ways to work my way through. So it took me six years to get through college. And you, um, the first one was at LSU and the rest were at the yeah, University Yeah, full time at Arizona. LSU and the rest was in Arizona. And that's where you got your degree in electrical engineering. Absolutely, Bachelor of Science degree. And how long did you stay out there, uh, Tom? I didn't stay out there much longer, in fact. Oh, I was really? in Tucson for uh, six or seven years. I'm not sure what the total was. but And uh, that included your time in school? That includes the time in school. I was working for uh, Burr Brown Research Corporation while I was going to school. Yeah. Taking about half, uh, towards the end, taking about half my classes at my job using a brand new technology of TV, <laughs> microwave technology and audio, uh, yeah. I could actually attend the classes from my workspace, which was six or seven miles from campus, and um, 
but I had all these engineers around me to help me to understand the issues and stuff like that. So I was, yeah. I was taking all the graduate level courses in my senior year in college. Well, I find that so interesting too because we, I mean, I, I'm not very computer literate by any means, but I've often thought this whole last 10 years the University of Phoenix was something new and you're going back 20 some odd years saying yeah, we were taking we were, classes we were before the same Phoenix. way. <laughs> <laughs> we were way before the University of Phoenix that uh, we came around. But we were uh, doing, uh, it was a microwave beam technology that was going straight from the university mm -hmm. to Burr Brown. Uh, it wasn't being beamed out on the internet or anything. Like right, that. right. So it was it was a captive place it, it was, was very captive, to. yeah. All right, well, we've got you through high school. Well, we've got you through the swamps and through high school and then college. And now I'd like to touch base on uh, how you met your wife. Well, Chris and I first met back in uh, the, the summer of our junior, senior year in high school. Oh, and so she uh, was from Louisiana also. Well, no, absolutely not. In oh. fact, <laughs> got you there. She, um, we, we attended, there were 60 students that attended a summer science training program that was six weeks at the university, at LSU, during the summer. Uh, and we spent three weeks studying math, three weeks in, in physics, and three weeks in chemistry. And the 60 of us as a group of 20 rotated through those different courses so that yeah. everything was being done all the time. So there were, there were, what was it, 20 girls and 40 guys that got into this program from high school. You had to apply and get accepted. And they were from all over the country. So it gave me an, an, an amazing oh opportunity. Oh, really? So you were almost like a host. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was going there on were, right in your were, backyard. There uh, were half a dozen of us that was in our backyard, yeah. yeah. And I, I went to LSU because it was easy, and it was a science training program. There were, there were other programs all around the country that you could get into. Yeah. And Chris got in as an alternate. Um, she had applied uh, and, and didn't know whether she would make it or not, but she, she did, yeah. to my benefit. Yeah. Um, but we really didn't get to know each other very well there. We had shared some courses, and we shared a lab bench in chemistry, the, the lab session and stuff like that. So we knew who each other was. Yeah. So we kind of thought that person's a little on the, on the different side, right? They, <laughs> I would go to the classes in the math building with a blanket wrapped around me being like uh, an Indian chief or something like that because it was cold as could be in the math building in Baton Rouge. And, and she just, she had some other things that she was doing and it, it was really strange. But, you know. Where was she from? I mean, if I was culturally. At that aware. time she was from Alabama, but she had only just moved there a year before from uh, Minnesota. Oh, okay. And her dad was in nuclear power plant construction and so he moved about every two years or more yeah. uh, from place to place. And uh, so she, she likes to say that in her 12 years of elementary or, or secondary education, she went to 12 different schools. Not every year, but yeah. there were some years when she went to two or three in a row. Yeah, so <laughs> she really went to 12 schools, though? 12 different schools, yeah, in, in, uh -huh. her, ele in her elementary school. That was always education. my fear growing up, that my parents were going <laughs> to move. <laughs> we're going to have to be the new kid. Oh, <laughs> well, I, I never take my moved. Hat off I, for that. I mean, I, I lived in Baton Rouge for 18 years, and so it was yeah. very strange to meet this person that was from all over. Yeah. Um, and we got to know each other. That first year in LSU, she came back to LSU from Alabama. And uh, she and I and two other guys kind of got together as a clique from that previous program yeah. and ran around, went to all the ball games and, and uh, shared a lot of our cl the same classes and things of that nature. And uh, towards the end of that year, she and I kind of got together as, a, as an item. Uh, we had taken dance classes and done some other things and we were great friends and we just, it, it developed into more than that. But then I had already made my mind up, I was going to Arizona. Yep. And uh, I got in my 1960 Volkswagen and drove off into the sunset that summer and left her behind. And, uh, you know, with all the standard promises of we'll, we'll communicate, we'll talk, right, we'll stay in right. touch, all that, and, you know. And it was a little diff more difficult in those days, wasn't it? It was more difficult, <laughs> <Yeah>. certainly more <laughs> than Facebook and things of that nature yeah. would be today. Um, but so I, I moved out to Arizona and, and went to school for a year. and. Uh, we kept going for a while and then we broke up for a while because we both felt like we needed to have our space and know what we were doing and kind of yeah. develop who now, we were Now meanwhile she's in Louisiana she's going She's still to in LSU. Louisiana. Yeah. And then spent the, uh, the summer at my parents' house because between semesters she couldn't, you know, she had an apartment arranged and then things broke out and she suddenly didn't have a place to stay. So my dad took her in and uh, I mean everybody knew her very well right, at this right. point. And uh, about that time we were in this process of breaking up and, and things of that nature. <laughs> and uh, kind of exploring our lives and seeing where we were and things. Right. And, uh, 
shortly after that, um, we got back together again and uh, just, just realized that we enjoyed each other's company that much and, and shared a lot of common thoughts and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. And she came out to Tucson yeah. and uh, transferred about a year after I did. Oh, really? And, oh, uh, so did I. So we both went to school together there. Oh. Uh, in Tucson, and we finally. So got you went to school at LSU together, and then in Arizona together. She came out and finished oh. her, her degree in Arizona as well. So, yeah. we we both had jobs. We're both working our way through school, and we got married in the middle of all that. Oh, uh, really? So you both were students at uh, University of Arizona. We were students at the University of Arizona yeah, together. Okay. Um, got married back in '78, and uh, graduated in '81. Oh wow. Uh, so you were living, I mean, so you were husband and wife, obviously, living together while you were going <laughs> to school. Much, yes. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that worked out really well. Yeah. Um, because we, we, we both had jobs at the mall uh, that we were doing with. And then when I got a job out at Burr Brown during my, my uh, later years, she was still working at the mall. We both had a car that we could drive Yeah. and uh, get back and forth and do school. And so we were just kind of juggling all that stuff at the same time. We had two dogs, yeah. Springer Spaniels and... and uh, cats and uh, that was our family at that point yeah. in time and now i'd like to go one more yeah. forward and, and talk about the family you have today and uh, uh if you could talk a little bit about your kids sure we have four kids uh, my oldest my daughter sharon is uh, 28 i believe she's married and living in manchester yeah. um, and she was born what five or six years after we got married so in 83 yeah and uh, fortunately we were out here um, because we needed some of the medical attention that we could get in Boston that we couldn't get in other places of the country. Um, then I have three boys, all two years apart, Mark, Patrick, and Nicholas. And Nick, my baby, is 21 years old now. Oh, gosh. Um, and he's been, uh, he, he's been a joy and is still at home along with his, his uh, next older brother. Uh, but Mark has moved back to, down to Baton Rouge and was going to LSU for a while. Oh, really? And yeah. now he's, he's living down there, just having a, a good time, just kind of taking care of himself and, and doing his own thing. Yeah. Um, has a lot of family around, but doesn't count on them at all, doesn't depend upon them, barely, rarely sees them, in fact. But, uh, but I, there's a comfort level in knowing that if he has a problem, there's somebody that can help now, him out. Now, is, is, is he the contrarian that followed your step, footsteps? <laughs> uh. <laughs> I don't know about that, yeah. but uh, to some degree, he's, he's definitely charting his own path. And I, I guess to a little degree, he would have to admit that he, he acknowledged what I did, Yeah. that um, stepping out and developing your own life is an important aspect of it all and proving that you can do it, Yeah. Um, proving that you are capable and you can take care of yourself and all those good things. And when you get that far away... You got no choice. You got right? no choice. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. You make a commitment and you just do what you have There's to do. There's no one to do the laundry but you. <laughs> There's that too. Yeah. Uh, if somebody was to come up to you, Tom, a new, uh, a young parent, they would just to say, Tom, if you could give me one bit of advice that might help me out, as far as raising kids. Do you have any advice that you'd give? Well, I, <laughs> that's a tough one. Um, Parenting is a lot more a lot more of a chore than you ever believed growing up. Um, having to be responsible and being able to take care of that that issue and that situation of this this developing mind, um, but trying to to let them grow to be their own person, trying not to control them, is a large part of where we've been. And uh, if the kids wanted to go to school or didn't want to go to school, we were going to try and encourage them to be the best they could be, yeah. but not not um, beat on them, not hold them up to live a life that we wished we had or something like that. So yeah. uh, letting them grow and develop and, and learn to be responsible and, and uh, take care of themselves, I think, is, is what I would encourage people to do. Oh, great. Um, you touched on it a little bit, but if we could go a little into what specifically brought you to Merrimack. Um, in other words, you're out in Arizona, and now eventually you end up in the Northeast. Well, I, I, I had an opportunity when I graduated to decide to make a complete change in my life again, right? You know? Yeah. And uh, I was working at Burr Brown Research, who has since been purchased by TI, but, um, and they were offering me a job as an engineer uh, when I graduated. Um, I went out on the interview scene because that's what everybody was doing, and I talked to Texas Instruments and, uh, in Dallas and decided I didn't really want to go there, and I talked to Unitrode Corporation up here in, um, or no, back then it was Sprague Electric that I went to work with. Okay, yeah down in uh, Auburn, Mass, or they were in Worcester. Yeah. 
and we moved to we decided to move to the northeast. It was something completely different for oh, me. Oh, totally different, right? Um, yeah, the south, the west. Never really east. seen snow in my life. I mean, I'd seen little bits of snow, but I'd never lived in snow. Yeah. Uh, didn't really know four seasons because Arizona doesn't have any more four seasons than Baton Rouge does. Um, and so it just, my wife knew the area because she'd been up in this area before. She was born and raised, she was born in New Jersey, but raised everywhere east of the Mississippi. Yeah. Uh, mostly north of, of Alabama, but she was in there for a while. Um, but so she we was, came she out. Was a, she was the expert of the two of you. Yeah, from, from <laughs> the, <laughs> with respect to snow and yep. skiing and all those kinds of things, she had an idea of what we were getting into. Right. Uh, but we moved up here to work for Sprague Electric. Um, and, and use the word we. Area. Did she go to work for them also? No, no, oh. she she did not. But oh. um, she she did a lot of volunteering work, and she worked in several banks and things of that nature when yeah. we first moved. Before we had a family to take care of. Right. Um, but generally, yeah, coming to work for Sprague Electric was it. And then since then, I would move about every. We moved about every four years, for a while there. So did you live um, in Massachusetts at one point? You know, that was in Worcester, Mass. Was yeah, so you lived right out I there. I lived right yeah. out there. I lived in Auburn, which is just south of Worcester, for yeah. four years. Beautiful, beautiful location and place. Mm -hmm. Back in the time when interest rates were on the order of 17 and 19 percent right. for homes, uh, so it was killing us because we still had a house in Tucson we couldn't sell. Yeah. Um, but fortunately, <laughs> we were doing it well enough with everything that we could get along. Uh, we moved out to Illinois, and um, Illinois, from there, I got transferred down to Dallas and decided I really didn't want to be down south again. So I started looking around and I got a job with Unitrode here in Merrimack and uh, came to work for Unitrode back in the And were they on Continental Boulevard? On Continental yeah. Boulevard, right yeah. where the Shaw's is right now. Yep. That whole building structure. And then I worked there, uh, you know, until PI bought us and uh, from 91 to 99 or so. And we built the, the building and we expanded the fab and we expanded the offices and everything like that. Mm -hmm. and then. Uh, Texas Instruments purchased us yeah. and then turned around and purchased Burr Brown. And I'm thinking, wow, they're just sweeping through my history here. <laughs> you know, but, um, they transferred me up to, to uh, Manchester shortly after they bought us because they wanted to shut the fab down and they wanted to take the design and marketing and all those folks and move them away from the, the factory yeah. um, just to keep attitudes separated and stuff like that. So we've been working out of the mill buildings up in Manchester since then. Very good. And now I'd like to talk about a little about your involvement in the community. You're you're uh, you're similar to Tom Mahon. Tom Mahon, I hated this question because I knew <laughs> I needed another another <laughs> two hours to answer it. So we basically just went by the committees that he was chairman of, and that, that took up ten. But if you could touch base again, and you've been very very involved in the community. But if you could touch base on some of the things you've uh, been involved in. Since you've been in well, it's, it's been fascinating coming to this area because growing up in Louisiana and Arizona and things of that nature, you're not nearly as close to your local government or your activities of what's going on. I never dreamed of being involved with committees, programs, councils, any of those kinds of things. So when I came up here in 91, I really didn't know what I was getting into. And, and uh, I kind of sat back and I, I heard about a town meeting and I missed the first one or two. And then I started attending them. And then I started getting involved. And Somebody asked me to be a part of the school planning uh, committee back in 95 that Tom was chairman of, yeah. looking to expand the schools. Uh, and that was the first time I got actively involved in things. And then I got involved with the school planning and building committee and finally got elected to that and spent a lot of time working on those kinds of plannings. Uh, from there, I went into the budget committee and worked my way up to vice chair and chair of the budget committee. And, uh, from and there. again, the budget committee back then handled both the town, both the and, town and the, and the school. school district. That's well. Yeah. And uh, and then I went in to become a member of the board of selectmen. Yeah. Uh, from the budget committee, the second term of the budget committee. I think I I missed my last year on the budget committee to to now be a town a board of selectmen member. Yeah. Um, and then we transitioned into the council and. Well, the other thing, too, I want to touch, you, you did something when you were on the Board of Selectmen and the Council that I really admired because I, I, I did it, too, but I hated it, and my attendance was nowhere near yours. <laughs> but uh, the Planning Board. Yeah. I mean, when you serve on the Town Council and the Planning Board at the same time, that is a commitment because they're there till 10 or 11 every Tuesday night, not every other wow, week. Lately yeah, it's not been so bad, but yeah. it, it, we're hoping as it's starting to pick up a little more, the economy's going to re recreate some of that. 
But that, that's been a lot of fun. When I was in the, the planning and building committee for the school district or the, the school space needs committees and stuff, I liked some of the, uh, the work that went involved with the planning department kind of things, you know, the things that, that walked around, how to, how to get things done, what kind of development you could do. So I had an interest in the planning board and uh, considered joining the planning board on my own before I got involved with the town council and then decided the town council would be a better place to be. Um, but yeah, I then took on both jobs and it does take a lot. When you're talking Tuesdays almost every week and then Thursdays every other week or yeah. when you and I were on the board together, I think it was weekly we were doing Thursday council meetings, board of selection yes, meetings and whatnot. Yeah. So that did take a lot of time, but yeah. uh, I, I've enjoyed being aware of what's going on, being a little bit in the know of where things are developing and what's happening. Um, but I tell you, the planning board is a very interesting organization because you, you're not going to make everybody happy. And yeah. if you want to try and, and be there to make people happy, you're in trouble because the planning board has got to make a decision one way or the other. And yeah. either the person bringing the plan in or the other people that don't like the plan are going to be happy with your decision. But you're never going to please them both. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've always thought the two toughest boards in this town uh, to be on were the planning board and the ZBA. You, you couldn't pay me to be on the yeah. ZBA. That's too close. I agree. You're, you're, dealing, with, you're <laughs> dealing with one on one. Somebody wants to build a, a mother in law apartment, and you, yeah, no, that, that's way. I, I like to go from 30,000 feet <laughs> dealing with 28,000 people, but I, I've always admired the people that do it, you know. That, yeah. uh, but those two boards, yeah, the Definitely planning not. board and the ZBA, it, it gets personal. I mean, I, I wasn't involved in the town at all, but I understand that Home Depot project got very personal. With, yeah, uh, I do. I do too. But I wasn't involved with yeah. it at that time. And, uh, but I mean, we we've seen stuff in our own thing. The mall. I mean, that's that was a major thing. You were certainly involved in that on the planning oh, yeah. board during Absolutely. the planning of that. But just, I just want to touch real quickly on the planning board. A lot of people misrepresent, misunderstand. I think, the planning board, and they keep thinking that uh, the planning board has an opportunity to do whatever they think is appropriate. And in fact, they're they're uh, guided by some very strict guidelines, the laws say that a person that owns a piece of property has a right to develop that piece of property. And so the planning board is working to try and guide them in a certain realm and guide them along our, our plans and our structures, but can't say no if they meet all the rules and the regulations that have been laid out. Right. Um, so the planning board is more of a guide and, a, and, a, and a, um, I'm not sure what the word is I want to use. But yeah, but I mean, I, I, you're, you're, you're explaining it right. If it's going to happen, let's make sure it happens. I, I remember that's what the it was the mall. Way, if yeah. it's going to happen, let's make sure it happens right, you know? Yeah, and, exactly. and, uh, and I think that that's it. Otherwise, uh, you know, there's they're, they're some doing leeway, that And there's some chances to get them to give some more back to the community or things of that nature, typically. But, yeah. I mean, there are strictly rules, and it's a quasi-judicial type situation. And so you can find yourself in court if you, if you make rash decisions that aren't justified. Yeah, and, um, and and the town is constantly fighting, dealing with those kinds of issues. Yeah. Well, now the next question has me asking you about hobbies, but I'm not going to ask that one because I want to make sure you answer it the right way. <laughs> and what I mean by is, I, I, I you've been a, I know one of the hobbies you're involved in. That I want to learn a little about. I'd like to talk about that. Is you've been very very involved in the whole robotics thing that. On, uh, goes on with the high school kids and mm -hmm. and I mean that's become a big thing in Merrimack and throughout the state where it's you know people go to the Verizon Center I wonder if you could touch base on that and uh, you know how you've enjoyed it and uh, just take it from there yeah I can I, I'm not involved with it so much anymore because my kids have gone through that phase they're all out of high school yeah. um, but the robotics program Dean Caymans who lives in Bedford uh, is an inventor and he decided that there wasn't enough interest in science and technology in the world and he looked around and he saw major league sports ball players and and various things being paid huge sums of money to go out and beat each other up uh, and things of that nature and uh, you know, between hockey and football and things of that nature it just bothered him that that the the people so many folks put up as as heroes and whatnot um, are being paid to play games and not adding a lot of value to the to society, if you will. I mean, right. entertainment and sports are valuable things. I mean, I'm not trying to put them down. But Dean Kamins looked at it and said, you know, there's got to be another venue to praise science and technology and to raise the interest level of kids in science and technology. And that's where he came up with this whole robotics program. And uh, first, for inspiration and recognition of science and technology, 
was his brainchild, and he set this up so that there's a challenge every year, and um, the kids are, are given the challenge in January, and they have like six weeks to develop a solution and build a robot that fits within a certain footprint, you know, like a yard by a yard by a yard yeah. uh, when it's compact and started, and can go out on this field that's 20 by 40 or 20 by 60 feet and compete with other robots to accomplish a task whether it's shooting a ball, kicking a ball, collecting things, yeah. you know, hanging stuff on racks or, or hanging themselves on a rack, um, things of that nature. So there's an amazing challenge working with engineers in the field and with themselves and their own equipment and tools and whatnot. They go out and fund and, and buy all this equipment and put this together, design it, but they're getting to work side by side with scientists, with engineers. Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, this, the, the, the neat thing about it, like you said, the Verizon Center, where they have one of their programs, one of the regional events, brings thousands of kids together and they're all cheering and having a great time dealing with these electronic robots and things of that yeah. nature. And uh, they get to be totally geeky and it's okay, you know? <laughs> well, no, and, and I was gonna say, cause I, again, from the, from the sidelines, I, I, my involvement, uh, involvement's a strong word, but me seeing it has been, the Fall Festival Business Expo. Uh -huh. they're, they're there every year, and they, they have their own little area, and they, they pro provide some of the entertainment. Sure. And uh, just watching how it's grown. But it used to be, you know, when we grew up, uh, is, you know, you were in the sports, or you were in the music, or you were in the cars, or maybe you were in the skateboarding and you know, doing yeah. your thing. And there wasn't as much a room for a kid that was into the chemistry set or whatever. And now there's just a whole culture of the robotics that goes on and the kids get it it's like a team sport they get excited oh, and it's very much like a team sport and that's how dean has intentionally set it up to try and give them something that they can get involved in be an active excited participant in and look to that as a as a role model for themselves yeah i mean i, I so. think the uh in the time it's gone on i think a lot of kids are, are doing stuff today that they wouldn't have done if that wasn't there i mean it's just a way to to get everyone going but i, I think it's just grown tremendously and i know merrimack embraces it and I know you've had a good a, a big involvement in Merrimack doing that I've, I've helped out yeah I, I well, worked with had BG a when my brother when my son was there and I've worked at Merrimack yeah. when my son was there so yeah well I just remember like when you were on the town council and so like you were you were always a big advocate of letting the people know what was going on well yeah so. that's a good thing to do yeah and Brian <laughs> McCarthy was doing that recently with his mm -hmm. children and, and things of that nature yeah. so it's it's going on. It's moving down. It's just some 15 years ago there was no such thing, and and now it's, it's about right. Yeah. yeah, and now it's a thing that is just it'll go on forever. I mean, it's something. We certainly excited. hope so, and it looks like it's got the momentum going and it's expanding. And Dean's idea is that it ought to be in every high school across the country. Yeah, and uh, it's working on it. It's yeah. not there, but it's trying. Okay, well, I'd like to finish the first segment of the show by asking what you do on a typical Saturday. Well, a typical Saturday lately, I've been trying to just catch up around the house and things of that nature. Uh, we've been uh, we've been blessed with a mild winter, but uh, yeah. um, I spend a lot of time at uh, my job at Texas Instruments during the during the week, yeah. and um, relax a little bit on Saturdays if I'm not going to the transfer station to unload trash or something like that. Uh, trying to keep up with just the house and things of that nature. Do a little bit, but not as much as I'd like. Uh, hiking or or getting outside. Um, that winter time, I don't do a lot of that, right. but um, just generally working around the house and, and Ca enjoying my family, kind of yeah. catching up with the fact that I've been away from them so much through council meetings or through working or whatever. Yeah. Um, so that's that's basically where I'm at. All right. Well, now I'd like to go with something we call the lightning round, and basically it's just another attempt to try and get to know your taste a little, a little bit about uh, what makes you tick, and it's. It's kind of just one word questions and the answers can be one word or there may be some that we'll elaborate on. It's all what the comfort level is. But I'll start off with uh, your first car. My first car was a 1960 Volkswagen. And uh, how long did you have that? I had that for probably four years or more. So did that, did that make the trek out west with you? It did. <laughs> it did. In fact, I bought it off my dad for $35. Oh, really? Ran a bunch of diesel fuel through it in order to try and clean it out some where normally you would put oil and um, got the thing running enough to be able to go to, to Arizona with it. And was it a Volkswagen Bug? I mean, was it was it a Beetle, yeah, yeah. Bug. And uh, the poor thing was just darn near its very last legs. There's a hill going into Las Cruces, uh, the yeah. other side of El Paso, down south, southern New Mexico. Yeah. 
uh, that I was going about 15 miles an hour by the time we got to the top of that hill. And that was all that poor car could do going on the interstate. <laughs> yeah. You know, we, uh, it was just amazing. It was an old, old Volkswagen that had semaphore turn signals. So it oh, actually really? had a little yeah. flag that would pop out. Yeah, right, right. And, oh, that, yeah, you don't see that no more. No, no. not at all. Uh, present car do you drive today? I drive a 300M Chrysler, which is a, a much bigger car. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, How nice do you like sedan. that, by the way? I love it. Uh, I had a Dodge Intrepid that I, I totaled uh, uh, and um, was able to replace it with this, which is basically the same car, different brand name. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's, it's an extremely nice car. I really enjoy the heated seats. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Uh, favorite TV show growing up? Wow, that's an interesting one. Um, back when we were little kids, we'd watch things like the Whirly Birds and, and uh, various things like that, along yeah. with the I Love Lucy's and yeah. getting a little further along the Happy Days and, and those kinds of shows. Yeah. Um, How so about today? Do you have time? Do you have any TV shows? The, the few, the, actually, the one program that I try to watch, if I get a chance to sit down and watch, is NCIS. Yeah. Uh, just enjoy the the characters and the action and the the attitude that they're taking and stuff like that. We my wife likes CI, CSI and we watch some of that as well. Yeah, um, but I prefer NCIS. Yeah, that's uh, they're, they're two for two. Uh, the le uh, yesterday I had Davis Powell on here and that's oh, what he okay. and he made it very clear that he was not talking about Los Angeles NCIS. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's that too. <laughs> oh. uh, favorite movie ever. Well, that's tough. Um, you know, I I don't really know what to pick there. I mean, I, Star Wars really hit me when I was in in college, and yeah. that first Star Wars came out, and we're zooming down the road afterwards, thinking we're dro flying flying fighter jets and stuff like that. But uh, I mean, so I really enjoyed that growing yeah. up. Uh, but you know, Lord of the Rings, I think they did an excellent job with that whole series. The Avatar was a fantastic movie. So. Yeah. Well, you're kind of giving us a feel for your genre anyway. There you yeah. go. <laughs> uh, last movie you saw at the theater? You know, I, I think the last one I, I saw and paid a lot of attention to was Alice in Wonderland, the remake uh, yeah. that they just did. Very interesting. <laughs> really, <laughs> yeah? But yeah. Yeah, just a little different, a little strange, a little, yeah. <laughs> little this and that, but uh, that uh, was fun. Uh, first job? My first job was working at a TGNY, a five and dime store. Oh, really? I was one of the stock clerks Yeah. Uh, while I was in high school. And uh, going back there, and, and my, my best, the best fun we had there was unloading the trucks when it would come in. They'd put up those ramps, and they'd start sailing those boxes down the ramps, and we'd turn the corner and send them back in. Yeah. And yeah. then try to sort them to the right side, whether they were hard goods or soft goods. Now, was that high school when you did that? Yeah, uh, it was. Yeah. And uh, we touched base, but exactly what is your title, and uh, what do you do right now? Well, uh, there's a good question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I work at Texas Instruments as an engineer. I started with Unitrode as a design engineer in the analog ICs, mm -hmm. integrated circuits. Yeah. Uh, moved into what we call the EDA, or Electronic Design Automation Group. And uh, what I'm doing now at TI is supporting the tools, the software and whatnot that the engineers are using to actually design the circuits that go into computers and power supplies and cell phones and all those kind of things. And right now I'm in a support mode where I support people worldwide. I have customers in Japan, China, Germany, Ireland, and, uh, and throughout the United States. So even though you've worked for companies that have been bought out, I mean, you're, you're kind of almost, if you trace back to your roots, you're almost with the same company you started with. Well, absolutely. I, I mean, stayed with electronic right. semiconductors. Uh, I was designing integrated circuits when I started at Burr Brown. Uh, back then we were at op amps. Now they're into these massive circuits. When you consider the difference in scale, yeah, uh, is they just they don't compare anymore. I mean, what we were doing is individual circuits. They're doing thousands and so thousands see, of. So again, you you stayed. You've been in the same field for say, but you've real. I mean, with the world we live in, you've really seen it change. I mean, I remember when Texas Instruments was at least here was known for its calculators. And that's yeah. it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So. I remember my first. Uh, SR10 or SR11 calculator back in, in high school. Yep. Um, but that whole world has changed so much. STI sells calculators and they sell these big graphic ones and stuff, but they don't make them anymore. Oh, they really? Just, they, they, did, just they just put their name them out on it. Put yep. their name on it and sell yeah. them. Uh, uh, favorite musical artist growing up? Growing up would probably be uh, Simon and Garfunkel or Mamas and the Papas or something of that order. Um, 
And how about now? Do you have any specific bands? I don't have any specific band. I, I'm really into country music and enjoy listening to country music. So the Randy Travis's, the Garth Brooks, Rio yeah. McIntyre's. Um, so like country music is your country choice. Country music in general okay. would be my preference, yeah. And, uh, if it's not church music. Right. <laughs> and uh, the favorite athlete, now you, we, you may have already let the cat out of the bag, but who knows what your answer will be, but your favorite athlete growing up. You know, it, it wasn't Pistol Pete. Um, it, it was probably Roger Staubach with the Dallas Cowboys. Oh, really? We yeah. were we were definitely because the Saints hadn't come to Baton Rouge to Louisiana yet at yeah. that point. So we were definitely Cowboys fans growing yeah. up, and Roger Staubach in that whole time period. But uh, you know, we certainly tracked and and uh, enjoyed all of LSU sports yeah. between, between the various different ones. But uh, football was certainly more on, on what I was interested in. We used to work the games as ushers and stuff like oh, that. Oh, really? In, in, huh? our, in our Boy Scout suits and uniforms, we'd go in and we'd usher people to their seats and things of that nature so oh, we could wow. get in and watch the games. Did you ever see Pistol Pete play in person? I did. Did you really? Did, yeah. 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 He was pretty impressive. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, let me see here. I, I almost lost track of where I was. Oh, <laughs> I did lose track of where I was. Ah, uh, favorite athlete today. I, you know, I really don't have a favorite yeah, athlete yeah. today. Um, I, I, don't sp I don't spend a lot of time, it seems unusual, but I don't spend a lot of time following sports yeah. at this point. And uh, I've got a lot of busy, busy things to keep me going right now. And okay, uh, favorite book that you've ever read? Favorite book that I've ever read? Probably Lord of the Rings um, would be my favorite. Okay. Um, and the last book you've read? Um, what did I read? The Four Agreements by Miguel Ruiz. Ruiz uh, was the last one I've read. It talks about life and, and uh, being true to your word and things of oh, that really? nature. Yeah, yeah, so it's one of those get to know yourself and yeah, get to yeah. know your place in the universe and uh, things of that nature. Wow, sounds kind of deep. It, it is a deep book. Yeah. In fact, I keep listening to it because there's so much in there that I haven't picked up the first time around. So I have it on audio book now. Oh. Okay, well, we're going to get ready to begin wrapping it up. And uh, what I'd like to talk about is uh, your per personal goals and uh, your bucket list, basically stuff that, that you still would like to get done in the next 10, 15, 20 years. Um, uh, well, you know, I've always had retirement in, in mind. Unfortunately, it's so far out there. I'm on the 100-year program, I think, yeah. as somebody <laughs> was telling me today. Uh, it's going to either be 100 years or the stock's going to have to go up above 100 before I'll be able to retire. But um, at some point in time, I want to be able to, to cut back on the working, the 40-hour the weeks or the 60- or 80-hour weeks or whatever they are. Yeah. Be able to spend a lot more time with my wife and, and uh, enjoy where we are. I mean, I, I love New England so much. It, it, it's funny because I grew up in Louisiana and went to school in Arizona, but moving into New England and enjoying – the relationships that we had, everybody outside of here thinks New England is cold and, and hard to get along with. And when I said I was moving here, they thought I was crazy. Yeah. Um, we came here and found the exact opposite to be true. But there's a, there's a threshold. You have to get to know somebody before they really want to get to know you. And, uh, but we've just enjoyed the heck out of New England. When we moved out to Illinois and when they shipped us down to Texas and whatnot, we said, you know what, we're going back to New England. And uh, I, I love the Four Seasons. Um, getting to know a little bit more about skiing and things of that nature is still on my list. And, uh, yeah. Now, have you ever skied? I have. Oh. Uh, I learned to ski when I first moved out here. Um, when I was down in, in uh, Auburn still, we'd go up to Mount Wachusett and, and yep. take ski lessons and whatnot. And went ice skating and promptly dislocated my left shoulder on an ice skating accident. <laughs> um, it was my first ride in an ambulance. So far, it's my last ride in an ambulance, and we're going to keep it that way. Uh, when with my arm sticking out the front here and you know twisted oh, behind wow. me, but uh, but yeah, I've really enjoyed winter sports, winter activities. I'm not into ice camping, you know, or snow camping, but uh, yeah, but I definitely enjoy getting out and and playing with. Speaking the snow. of that, though, where you were a fisherman, have you ever done any ice fishing during your time? No, up I have there? never ever ice fished. You know, it's always struck me as something kind of bizarre. Yeah, why I, did you go to the freezer and pull out a block of that, frozen fish? I. You know? I <laughs> When I was growing up as a kid, I, I enjoyed fishing, and uh, then as I got older, I did some fishing. We'd go up to Pittsburgh every year, but I, I have never understood. I mean, far as I can figure out, it's a good excuse that they go out to drink. 
Yeah. I mean, because I, I can't understand why going to watch a flag come down yeah, is, exactly. is fishing. You know, I have trouble with that. Well, and I grew up with fly fishing. And yeah. uh, we would, we would uh, go around the lake, which was just a block away from our house in, in Baton Rouge, and catch turtles and stuff with nets. But when yeah. we would actually go fishing, we were actually fly fishing with popping bugs and, and top lures and stuff like that. I never did any casting or really very much, you know, bait casting fishing or anything of that nature. And so uh, ice fishing would be just sitting around freezing. Yeah, you know, right. And, just, you know, and I, you kind of said you don't haven't done much fishing since you moved up here, per se. No, I haven't. Uh, um, because most of my fishing down there was from boats in, in lakes and along the edges. Could you of the, see of the during your retirement stuff. years you're getting back into I that? I definitely could. I need to get you know somebody to help me learn the, the ropes in the areas uh, yeah. around here how do you do that but uh, you know I've seen the pictures of the guys in, in waders and whatnot out in the stream fishing and yeah I've never done anything like that so it'd be it would be fascinating to get to more into more of that right uh, where would you like to retire um, you know I'm happy as can be here right now and uh, I, I could envision staying here for an extremely long time um, my dad is down in uh, western North Carolina and uh, in the mountains there yeah. and uh, very much enjoys it there and, and it is beautiful. It's gorgeous. And the weather's a little bit more temperate, not quite so much snow and uh, they have some ice that we don't have all the time, but you know, yeah. um, I could see doing that. You know, they talk about the J-hook of people going down to Florida and then coming halfway back into the Carolinas. Yeah, I've heard a lot like about that. that in the past year and or two. I, you know, I've thought about Florida and said, you know, I, I grew up in the heat. I really don't need that in my life. Um, like heat, but it's, you know, <laughs> it's, it's not the driving force for me. And when it gets too hot, there's not only so much you can take off. Yeah. Um, so I prefer to be in a, in a little bit more moderate uh, or temperate area and if I were to move from here it'd probably be down towards the Carolinas yep. uh, something in that area but I uh, you know I don't see any great rush to do that in my life you know. right I just I'm, I'm really pretty excited in other words, this is this look is where we home. are I mean we're we're so close to Boston if we want to get quote-unquote culture or something yep. like that we're so close to the mountains the White Mountains or the Green Mountains uh, we're close to the ocean although you can't swim here like you can down in the Gulf of Mexico yeah. Um, the few times I've been out in the ocean here, it's just darn cold. Um, yeah. Grew up on the on the Gulf of Mexico in Pensacola, Florida, every summer. And oh, it's tough. Like yeah. my uh, my wife's parents have a place in Wells Beach, and it, it uh, kills me when it's sixty two degrees. They're all talking about how it's bath water. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you hit on it in Merrimack in particular, not just the Northeast. In my opinion, Merrimack. People say to me, "What do you love about Merrimack?" I say, "I don't think you could find a better geographic location if you tried." Oh, yeah. uh, we're, we're in our own world, part rural, part town, part, you know, whatever, but we're not the city. But yet we got cities on both sides of us. We got the mountains. We got Boston. I mean, it's ju I just don't think you could find a better place than Merrimack, New Hampshire, you know? And the same reason I haven't you yet. just touched base. <laughs> but, uh, moved so back here in 1991, and uh, even though I've been here for, what, 21 years, I'm still a newcomer in town. Yeah. But uh, definitely have, have very much enjoyed being here. And, that, that's like one of the, the things I've area. been saying with the guests. Like, uh, I've been here, I think, 17 now, and I was saying with Davis Powell, I said, you know, in Merrimack, if you're here less than 20 years, it's like the moving van's still in your driveway. <laughs> and he said, 20 years, you're being kind. It's much more <laughs> than that. I, I think they're, he's, he's right. <laughs> well, we're coming to the close of the show, and my final question is, uh, when it's all said and done, and uh, you've moved on to another life, uh, how would you like to be remembered by your friends and family when they're talking about you? I don't want to give them any ideas. But, uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I want to I be remembered as somebody who was honest and truthful, uh, respectful uh, in all the dealings that I've had with people and uh, somebody that people could count on, um, that, that my integrity showed through, uh, that I was responsible for my actions to myself and, and for what I attempted to do. And that's the way I've been running my life. That's the way I continue to run my life, is to, to do the best that I can for everybody. Um, the, the joy I've had in, in working, let me just if I have a moment, just for a short oh, segue. Chris, Chris and I took a, a, a course called Sacred Gifts. And uh, what it does is it talks about uh, 24 different gifts, if you will, or types of personalities and things like that, from teachers to musicians to artists to craftsmen to to uh, service, to leadership, to all those different things. And you, you start filtering out what are some of your own personal spiritual gifts or sacred gifts. And service is one of my sacred gifts. When you look down at it, 
what is it that I enjoy doing? Well, I enjoy working for and helping other people. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of those other ones you wish were yours. I mean, I, I have a certain amount of music um, because of my singing, certainly not because of my instruments because I can't play a stick, but, um, and things of that nature. So those are some things that I'm trying to develop right now and look into how can I work those parts um, of who I am. And so I've got some opportunities coming up to be in service in other areas uh, besides town government and things of that right. nature, and I'm, I'm going after those. Uh, I've got some opportunities to uh, be on a stage or be a trainer or be up in front of people singing and, and things like that, um, and I'm trying to go after more of those issues and situations uh, to give back to people, to help them to, to learn, develop, to grow themselves. Wow. So that's where I'm going. Yeah. I'll tell you, Tom, I really enjoyed this. I uh, tell you, this, this idea of interviewing the, of, of interviewing the candidates has, has been one of my good ideas. Because, I mean, I, and what I mean by that is what I have gotten out of it. This is just every person that comes up has such a story. And you, you think you know people like me and you have known each other, per se, for eight or ten years. But oh. I've learned more about you in the last 40 minutes than I know people at home did. And, uh, you know, I can't say I was amazed that you were a contrarian. But... <laughs> But, but uh, with that being said, uh, it, it was just great. And thank you very, very much for joining us today. And um, uh, good luck on April 10th. Your name will be on the ballot for town council. Again, you're a sitting councilor now. And uh, good luck to you, sir. Yeah, thank, thank you, you, Tom. Appreciate it. Thank Thanks, you. Dave. Bye-bye.